working on in-person programs? Say that again, uh, Mary. Are you working on in-person programs again? We also? are working on in-person programs and we are hoping that come the fall, and that is an email that I have to send to you because we have a couple really exciting opportunities. Um, the Madison Estates, the 501 at Madison would like to host us um, and do like a little like, you know, food and beverage and, you know, have everybody come to um, to their site and be able to offer some in-person programming as, as well. So we are hoping to move forward to in-person programs come September 1. Great. All right. Thanks. So be on the lookout for those fun details. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a gorgeous day outside. I am uh, Kathy Salisbury. I'm the director of the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University. And um, we can just practice with your reactions here. And if you all could give a thumb, thumbs up and let me know if you have been to the Ambler Arboretum before, it'd be great to know that. And while I'm waiting for you all to find your reactions and to be able to do that, we, uh, so, we, uh, excellent, thank you. So the Ambler Arboretum, as most of you probably know, is in um, Upper Dublin, and it is the 187-acre campus of um, Temple University. And we are open for free to the public seven days a week, 365 days a year from sunrise to sunset. We're here as inspiration, education, relaxation, recreation, all the shuns you can do <laughs> here. And so we want um, people to come and visit. It is a community resource for you. So, um, so please consider visiting us. We have a rich history and um, lots of stories to tell, but also for our community, we wanna be a place where you can come and visit and be inspired about what you can do in your gardens, about what you can plant in your gardens that the deer won't eat, and cool combinations you could put together, plants that are interesting in all seasons. We have flowers every month of the year here. So we want you to come here, be inspired and um, come and visit, bring your friends and your family and all of that good stuff. So with that, um, today's talk is about weeds and weed identification and weed management. And so basically gonna give you a, a quick insight into, into the world of weeds. And these are the weeds, you know, um, we're gonna talk about what is the definition of a weed. And it just so happens on Thursdays, I work out in the gardens with my staff. And so today I was assigned by my staff to full weeds. So um, very much in the mindset today of, of weeds and weeding. So we're gonna share my screen. And again, as, as Tammy said, you can put your questions in the chat box and um, I will get to them as I see them, if I see them, if not, I will get to them at the end and we'll have a, a, a question and answer period there. So also, if there's something that you're hoping I will cover or a question that you have already in your head, feel free to put that in the chat now. And if I get to that area, I'll make sure, I'll try to address it. So, so if you're already thinking of questions or if you have something specific you were hoping to, to learn today, feel free to put that in the chat as well. So let me share my screen here. Um, here we go. You should. Okay, so you should all be able to see that now. And all right, so we're gonna, so there's a little bit, there's some chemical stuff in here, but we're gonna focus mostly, mostly on types of weeds and management of them in ways other than chemicals, but um, we're gonna get started. So the first thing we need to talk about is what is a weed, right? So um, you could put in the chat box how you define a weed and what do you think a weed is? So you can put that in there. You can take a look at that. Um, so you can go ahead and throw in the chat just how do you define a weed? Let's see how that works. While I'm waiting for you to do that, poison ivy does not have thorns. And um, sometimes you could bring a weed sample to Temple for us to identify, but there is Penn State Extension. Every county has an extension office. They may still be working from home, but you could, they can do a lot through photos. And um, that's what they do. They have a, um, a whole office of people that just help answer your garden questions. And it's completely free. 
and it's in every county. So um, I highly recommend you reach out to Penn State Extension for your uh, weed identification, insect identification, disease identification, plant identification, all of that they can do. So um, I see a couple definitions of weeds, something you don't want in your garden, something that was not planted by us, um, anything I don't want, anything growing where you don't want it to. Right, so exactly. So that's the basic definition of a weed. I always use the example of an oak tree. Right now I have an oak tree and I love oak trees, but it's growing right at the base of my steps in front of my house. So right there in that place, although I love oak trees and I usually don't cut them down, I leave them be, that oak tree is a weed um, because it just cannot stay right there. And, um, and being a weed is all relative, right? So this is a dandelion. You can see, you might, I don't know if you can tell in my background, I have dandelions, the whole progress of dandelions. I'm a big fan of dandelions. Um, so I don't always weed them out of my garden because I don't always consider them weeds. Um, so they are, you know, some people see a weed and other people see a wish. You might have seen this before, but uh, dandelions were brought here as food and medicine by the colonizers who came here. Um, it has, it's high in vitamin C. Um, and so it kept people healthy during the long voyages across the oceans. And um, it was cultivated as a vegetable here. It escaped cultivation and now is in our um, lawns and bothers us, but it's not an ecological problem at all. It just mostly is a pest of our non-native monocultures that we call lawns. So, um, so it doesn't really bother me a lot to see this here. It's not native, but, um, but it certainly does a lot more. It's great for early season pollinators, um, but I understand that some people don't enjoy it. So, so what is a weed is all relative too. You might go into somebody's yard and think it's full of weeds and they're thinking it's full of wildflowers, right? So, um, so we're gonna, so that's a definition of weed. A weed is just a plant growing somewhere that you don't want it to grow. A noxious weed, uh, so we're going to cover noxious weed, invasive plant, exotic plant, native plant, just so we can get those terms out of the way. Um, so we're all on the same page. Uh, this weed here, you might have seen this. So I'm going to try and talk about the plants that are in the pictures because you might have seen them in your yard. This is um, nut sedge, it's called, yellow nut sedge. It has a triangular stem, very angular leaves. These are the flowers. It has a, it's called nut sedge because underneath in the roots, it, the roots have these little nodules on them that um, fall off and create new plants. And so if you're pulling out this plant, it's leaving those nodules in there to grow more of. This one is very hard to control. It has waxy leaves, which means chemicals probably won't stick to it as well. You have to be very specific in the chemicals that you use. You can only, if you hand pull it, you leave those nodules in there. So, so some weeds are, are harder to control than others. So we have um, noxious weeds, invasive plants, exotic plants. So a noxious weed. So you can go on to the USDA plant database and find a list of noxious weeds. And noxious weeds are any plant or plant product that can directly or indirectly injure or cause damage to crops. So this noxious weed list that the state and the federal government have put together are primarily focused on agricultural crops. So um, horticultural, displays, landscapes really weren't considered until very recently um, when it comes to noxious weeds. Um, but they're getting there now with things like purple loosestrife, lithrum salicaria is now being considered a noxious weed. And that's more of a pest in wetlands and uh, landscapes than it is agricultural fields. So, uh, so you can, again, go on the USDA plant database and learn about noxious weeds. And these are these are plants that if you are if you're going to do research on them or if you're going to propagate them or collect seeds, you need a permit. You have to get a special permit to, to do that. The picture that we see here, this is called mile a minute or tear thumb, T-E-A-R thumb. Um, we know this by its triangular leaves. It's a vine and these uh, just almost perfect triangles here, right? Very straight lines. And it's called tear thumb. If you look closely at these stems of the vine, they have tiny little recurved thorns on them that can uh, that are sharp and um, painful when you go try to rip this out. And these blue fruits are why this plant was brought here in the first place. So a lot of our weeds that we have were either brought here as food, as medicine, or as ornamental plants through the horticulture trade. 
So that's usually the way they get here. And this was brought as an ornamental plant through the horticultural trade. They escaped cultivation and now it grows wild all over. Um, you might have seen this, it's growing both where I live and then here at the Arboretum, we have it as well. But I mean, the fruits are beautiful. So you can see why somebody might want to plant it. All right, so um, invasive plant, that's a plant that is non-native to the ecosystem in question and causes economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. So that varies. So it, it, whether or not a plant is invasive varies by the ecosystem in question. Just because it's invasive in one spot doesn't mean it is invasive in another spot. But generally, all invasive plants are weeds. Exotic plant just means non-native. It doesn't mean it's invasive. It doesn't mean it's noxious. It doesn't mean it's a weed. It just means that it's not native to the ecosystem in question. And then a native plant, of course, is a plant that evolved in the ecosystem in question with the climate, with the insects, with the soil fungus, uh, and is part of the system and supports the system. So, so that's um, some important um, terminology to know when we're discussing plants. All right, so you have a weed. How do you, how do you know what it is? Like, what do you do to identify it? Now, there's so many weeds that are out and everybody has different weeds depending on their soils, their gardens, where their soils come from if they brought in soil, uh, the pH of the soil, the sunlight. So I'm gonna talk to you about how to identify weeds and where do you look to learn who they are. This one, of course, again, is pretty familiar. This is the dandelion. Um, so there's different ways to look at weeds, right? So this is the dandelion flower. It's really pretty. They actually have a cultivar now of a pink dandelion. I don't know if you all have seen that. People are selling it, the pink dandelion, right? So you can, so we'll look at, when we're, when we're trying to identify weeds, we wanna look at the habit of the weed. So that is the shape, how it grows. Um, so this we call a basal rosette when all the leaves are down at the, uh, emerging from the bottom of the plant. This is what we call basal rosette. We notice it has toothed leaves um, and it's basically round in shape. So that's a habit. We can look at the habitat. So where is it growing? So we have habit, which is the form of the plant. We have habitat, which is the location of the plant. Is it growing in a wet area, dry sun, uh, shade, you know, where uh, uh, the edge of a, of a woodland or right in the middle of a field like this, where is it growing in the lawn? So you can look at it that way to, then you can look at the flowers. This is all dandelion still. And you can look at the fruits or the seeds of this, right? So, um, so you want it, you can use a lot of clues to figure out who these plants are. This, these are um, dandelion roots, right? So uh, this is, these are edible. As I mentioned, the dandelion was brought here as a vegetable. So the dandelion roots are edible. This is a tap root. And we're gonna talk a little bit later when we're talking about managing plants, understanding the root structure of the weed is really important to understanding how to manage it. If you just pull the dandelion leaves off the top, look at all this root that's left. That's gonna send, that has so much energy in it. That's gonna send another plant up in no time. Um, so you really need to get the whole root out if you're gonna um, try and manage your dandelion. And then of course, here we see certified organic dandelion greens for $3.49 a bunch, right? So it's food. It's a commodity, people buy it. People, I have never bought dandelion, but people do buy dandelion. I see it for sale all the time at um, Weaver's Way or at the Whole Foods or at Wegmans, you can find it there. So, um, so it's commodity, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at a weed. And, but there's also a lot of different characteristics you can use when you're identifying plants. Two great plants. Uh, two great resources that I use for identifying weeds. One, this one, uh, this UVA, UVA um, book, Weeds of the Northeast, is excellent for weed identification. It shows you what the seedling looks like. It shows you what a flower looks like. It shows you the habit. Um, and it is, I don't know that I found a weed yet that, that wasn't in this book. So, uh, uh, and mostly herbaceous weeds. So herbaceous means that they don't get, um, bark on them. So, so they're like our perennial and annual weeds are in here. There's some woody plants in there, but for woody plants, this Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast book, that's great for trees and shrubs, weeds, if you wanted to identify those. I really like this book for that. So, um, so if, you're, if you wanted to identify the weeds in your garden or um, wherever you are working or whatever, these are the two 
two um, books that I highly recommend. So there, when we're doing weed identification, when we're trying to figure out who a weed is, there are various things to look for. And just like when we're identifying plants out in the landscape, um, this is what I do. I teach plant identification here. It's one of the things I do, uh, but it's something I really enjoy is figuring out what these plants are, um, putting names to, to mystery plants. So grasses and broadleaf weeds um, have different features that you can look at to help you identify them. Now, why, why, do, why should we identify a weed? Well, who cares? We know it, if we know that a plant that's growing somewhere we don't want it is a weed, then what difference does it make who it is, right? Why do we care who this weed is? Just pull it out and get rid of it. Well, we wanna know who it is so that we know if pulling it out will get rid of it, how far down we have to dig to get its taproot out. If, um, if we use chemicals, we wanna know that the chemical will be effective on it so we're not wasting money or materials or hurting the environment by putting something on unnecessarily. So, so we wanna know who they are. We wanna know if it's an annual or if it's a perennial, what its life cycle is so that we don't waste time with something that's going to die at the end of the year anyway. So, so it's important for us to figure out who these are. So with both grasses and broadleaf, so grasses, you know what they are. Broadleaf just means wide leaf weed. We wanna know their life cycle, their habit, their habitat. Um, cotyledon shape, those are the seed leaves, the first initial leaves that come out after it germinates the leaf shape, the leaf texture, leaf arrangement, if there's hairs, how the veins are arranged, their color of the leaves, the color of the flowers, the color of the stems, any of the flower characteristics and the root structures. So those are all what we look for for trying to figure out weed identification of broad leaves. And then grasses have their own vocabulary. So we have ligules and oracles and sheaths, um, but basically again, it's looking at the characteristics of the plant. So, uh, so the types of weeds, of course, we have woody plants. So we have trees and shrubs and vines, ground cover weeds, and we have broadleaf weeds, grasses, and sedges. And somebody asked about poison ivy in the chat earlier, and some people would consider poison ivy a weed. Um, I don't. It's very important for wildlife. Uh, it's a very important food source for migrating and residential songbirds. And so I don't consider it a weed. Um, unless it's growing right now, it's growing underneath my kayak rack. So every time I go to get my kayak out, there's poison ivy there. So now that's a weed right there. But generally, I think of it as a very beneficial native plant. So that just shows you how the context is what creates the weed in a lot of cases. So weeds compete um, by being less picky than the plants you have around them, usually. They don't need uh, they grow in a wider variety of soil pHs, a wider variety of sunlight, a wider variety of drought and moisture conditions in the soil, and that's how they're able to compete so well. And they're generally successful because they um, have multiple ways of propagating themselves, so they get a ton of seeds, they spread by underground roots, um, you know, so, th so there's multiple ways that they can move around, and um, again, they're less picky. And generally, our weeds are foreign to our ecosystem, right? So, so the, the, their natural checks and balances don't exist here. So they're able to grow better because there's not a soil fungus that's keeping them in check or an insect that's keeping them in check like there are with our native plants. So this is how weeds are able to thrive so well. And we have three major life cycles of weeds. And so we have annuals, perennials, and biennials. And here we have three similar looking plants, and, um, but they have different life cycles. So we have annuals. So annuals grow, flower, set seed, and die in a single year, in a single growing season. Perennials grow, flower, set seed, go dormant, and repeat that cycle for three or more years. Now you have short-lived perennials that might only last five years or so, and then you have long-lived perennials where they can come back for hundreds of years. Um, so those are perennials and annuals. And then we have biennials. Biennials grow flower. Uh, they grow the first year. So the first year of their growing season, they're just vegetative. So they're just leaves. The second year, they have their leaves, they send up a flower stalk, 
they flower, they set seed, and then the whole plant dies. So the plant lives just two years. And a lot of times they set seed and a new plant comes up in the same spot. But if it's a biennial, true biennial, it's not the same plant. It's the seedlings from that plant. So knowing the life cycle of a weed is really important too. I'm going to give an example of a biennial. There's a garlic mustard that grows throughout here. We, we consider it an invasive plant. It has white flowers in the spring. It starts its first year as a rosette of leaves. And um, the second year, it sends up its flower and a set seed. And then it'll die. If you were to go out now, you would find garlic mustard all over the place that has seed, seed heads on it. There's no point in uh, there's no point in pulling that out now because it's already set seed and the plant's going to die. There's just no reason to pull it out. There's no reason to spend the energy to do that because it's a biennial. Um, if you knew the plant well, you'd pull it out with, when it was a rosette or while it was flowering because it's really easy to identify. You pull it out while it's flowering and then you don't, um, then it won't set seed and you're not dealing with a seed bank in future years. So, so understanding the life cycle of weeds is really important. Annuals. If you know it's already gone to seed, no point in trying to pull it out. It's just gonna die the next year. It's gonna die at the end of the year and the seeds have already been sown. So, so understanding your life cycle of the weed can help you better know how to manage the weeds in your, in your landscape. So we have annual weeds. We have two types of annual weeds. We have summer annuals and we have winter annuals. So summer annuals, these are the ones that we're seeing now. They um, germinate in the spring and they grow all through the summer and then they die in the fall. So why is it important to know if it's a summer annual or a, a winter annual? So a lot of times we put down what we call pre-emergence. So they stop seeds from growing if you're using some sort of chemical. Um, you, you put down a pre-emergent and this stops the seed from germinating. Well, if it's a summer annual, you can put down your pre-emergent in early spring before these roots start because once these roots even though there's no leaves on top, once this root starts to grow, that seed has germinated and um, a pre-emergent will not work anymore. So early spring, usually like the middle of March, you put down these pre-emergent and then that'll control your summer annuals. And people do that and then they wonder, gosh, I'm still getting weeds and it's probably the winter annuals that you didn't catch. So some examples of summer annuals, they um, purslane, crabgrass, foxtail, lamb's quarter, ragweed. This is purslane here, fleshy leaves. This is edible. You can, people do eat this. It's kind of a peppery taste, very fleshy leaves, these purple stems here. There are lookalikes that are not edible, so make sure you positively identify this. Crabgrass is a summer annual. Foxtail grass is a summer annual. So once these have gone to seed, um, there's not really any much point in controlling them unless you just don't like the looks of them because their seed is already sown, they're going to die at the end of the year. Lamb's quarter and rag and um, and ragweed. This is ragweed here. So um, then there's winter annuals. So winter annuals germinate in the late summer or fall. So um, the seeds are in the ground and they don't start to germinate until summer or fall. So if you put a pre-emergent down in early spring, it's not gonna catch these. So you actually need to put a second pre-emergent down. If you have trouble with winter annuals, you wanna put a second pre-emergent down in um, like August or July to catch these seeds before they germinate. So they mature seed and die the following spring or summer. So they basically they're called winter annuals because you see them come up when it's really cold out. Like this is chickweed, so you'll see that in very early spring when it's still chilly out, henbit and um, bluegrass and shepherd's purse are all examples of winter annuals that you will see. So, um, so if you are not concerned or if you're not putting down pre-emergence, you're not using chemicals in your lawn or in your property, then um, maybe it doesn't matter as much about the winter annuals or summer annuals, but this does give you an idea of when seeds are germinating and when you can expect weeds to, to come in your garden. And if it seems like there's two flushes of weeds, that is in fact the case. They just have different, um, different life cycles. And so some can be both, right? Some can be, you can find them in winter or summer, they're annuals. So common ground cell and prickly lettuce are examples of plants that will germinate throughout the year 
and um, bloom and flower in, win uh, in colder seasons or warmer seasons. So you might see those around any time. Now biennials, I mentioned, they are over um, in their first year, they are just a rosette of leaves. They're just vegetative. And then the following year, they put up a flower stalk, they bloom, they flower, they seed, and then they die, right? So this is biennials. So some examples from biennials, they can grow from seed anytime in the seasons. They produce a rosette of leaves near the first, you know, the first year, and then they flower mature and die in the second year. So wild carrot, um, which we know as Queen Anne's lace, or some of us might know as Queen Anne's lace, that is um, a biennial. Burdock is a biennial, although I will say I have a burdock that I keep in my yard, um, mostly because I like the story about how it inspired Velcro, and it just I just like the little purple jobs here in the flowers. Um, my burdock seems to come back every year. So I feel like I have a perennial burdock because it's definitely the same plant because it is enormous. Um, bull thistles are biennials. And so um, this one, this one to know about. Uh, garlic mustard is another one that's, that's biennial. There's a lot of biennial leaves. And then perennials. They, um, the first year they set seed, they grow, they might not flower the first year. And then the second year they um, flower, set seed, go dormant, flower, set seed, go dormant for years to come. And so they live for more than two years, so right, three or more years. And then there's two types of perennials. There's um, simple perennials and then there's creeping perennials. This plant here is pokeweed. Um, the, the fruits are toxic, but it is a native plant, so toxic to us, not to birds um, or other wildlife, but it looks very tropical. I actually really like it for in the garden and it's a tap-rooted perennial. It's really difficult to get rid of. If you just go and pull it out, it'll just keep coming back and coming back. Usually you find this growing along um, fence rows or fence along fence lines. Uh, wherever birds can sit, because birds will eat the seeds, sit, and then um, poop the seeds out. And that's why you get a, or underneath power lines. That's why you get, that's where you get a lot of these popping up here or under branches of bigger trees. So um, pokeweed, broadleaf plantain, dandelion, they have these tap roots. And then you have these creeping perennial weeds, which spread by vegetative structures. So either roots or stolons, modified stems along the um, ground. And so just for um, discussion sake, I've circled the plants here that are native that are called weeds by some books and uh, by Penn State Extension. So pokeweed, milkweed, poison ivy, Virginia creeper, they're called weeds, but these are native plants. They're the very important parts of our ecosystem where we are here in uh, Southeastern PA. So again, remembering that not everything that somebody thinks is a weed is a weed. Um, might or is a weed to you. So you just want to keep that in mind. So uh, just an example of weed life cycles. So here we go again with our annual. So here we see um, the th this is our summer annual. So it just completes its life cycle in one growing season in one year. And ragweed is an example of that. Chamomile is a winter annual. So it starts at the last, the late end or the middle of one year and then completes its life cycle in the middle of the second year. So it grows through the colder months. So that's a winter annual. Biennial, here you go, just two years of growing and then it doesn't live anymore. And then perennial, three or more years. So if we're talking about grass and grass-like weeds and we wanna figure out who they are, this is, um, you probably all have seen this, this is Japanese stilt grass and it is pervasive around this area. It was introduced as a uh, packing material for ceramics in the shipping containers and the seeds escaped and that's how it started getting around. Um, Japanese stilt grass, it's, um, it's probably about six, eight, 10 inches tall right now. It's the chartreuse green usually, but the one way you can tell it from any other grasses that you might have is that, see the silver midrib here on the leaf, it's sort of off center call it a midrib, but it's a little off center and it's this silver color. That's how you know Japanese stilt grass. Um, that's pretty reliable, single characteristic for this particular weed. 
Um, it does look a lot different than a lot of our native grasses, but but that silver midrib tells you I'm silk grass, rip me out. And this is an annual. And so again, in order to control this, what you wanna do is keep it from setting seed. And so most recommendations are to let this plant grow until um, about July. And then in July, it starts setting up its flower stalks. And that's when you wanna go and just weed whack it down to the ground or pull it out because it's used, it's, uh, you wanna get it before it sets seed. If you're gonna pull it out, you could pull it out anytime. And um, you just wanna keep it from setting seed. So if you remember one year of seeds, seven years of weeds, uh, because what happens is the seeds create a seed bank and not all the seeds germinate every year. And each year it just keeps adding and adding to it. So um, you have to keep at this. So you'll pull all this out and, and then next year there'll be silt grass there again. You'd be like, what is going on? I just pulled all this out and it's annual. So how is it still here? And that's because you're working through the seed bank. And so you just have to keep pulling and pulling until all the seeds are exhausted. And the only way you're gonna do that is if you keep this from going to seed. So that's sort of how you treat annuals in the landscape, um, any of the annual weeds. So uh, there's different types of ways that grasses grow and spread. Uh, stilt grass spreads in a, in a number of different ways through seeds, but then also it'll spread, um, it, its stems will layer in the ground and get roots and then spread that way. And um, so there's bunching grasses, and then there's grasses that spread by, um, here we have uh, rhizomes. So these are modified stems or modified roots that spread underground. Oh, yeah, here you go. Here's an example of rhizome. So quackgrass, Canada thistle, Kentucky bluegrass all spread this way. And this is important to know because if you're a young person just out of college and you decide that um, this vacant lot that you're gonna turn into a garden should be rototilled uh, to get the weeds out of it. And you don't understand that the weed that's growing there grows by rhizomes and spreads by rhizomes. And then you rototill it, you have 10 million more weeds than what you started with because every place the rototiller chops up, this is a new plant. And these little pieces grow, all of these little rhizome pieces grow into a brand new plant. And so I did that. I did that and I, that was me. That was my experience when I was first out of school. Uh, it was awesome because then I had like 50 times more work to do to get all of those weeds out. So understanding how your plants grow is really important for management. The last thing you wanna do is go and rototill an area that has um, plants that spread by rhizomes. Um, my neighbors just did that in their own vegetable garden and now they're paying for it too. So with a, with a different kind of weed. So. So it does happen. So you, you want to be aware of that. Stolons are modified stems. So think strawberries, how strawberries move, or um, uh, spider plants. So the house plant, spider plant, they send out that little stem that gets a new baby on the end of it. That's also a stoloniferous plant. And so these are stolons, modified stems, where they, when they touch the ground, they create a new plant. So that's different than rhizomes, which are underground modified roots. So crabgrass, Bermuda grass, and ground ivy all spread by these runners. They though they can spread um, when you rototill, they could spread the same way because all of these will become new plants that send out new runners. And then in, um, in grasses, at least, we're dealing sort of like we have uh, broadleaf, summer and winter and uh, annual weeds. We also have warm season versus cool season grasses. And that's when they are growing and active. And here you see, you can, if you look really closely, you can see fall color here on these trees. There's some fall color. And so that means this is cool temperatures. So these are, this is a mixture of cool season and warm season grasses. The cool season grasses are green and thriving because it's cooler temperatures. The warm season grasses that grow when it's warmer out are going dormant. And so that's what you're seeing in this picture here. And so knowing that life cycle is important too if you're gonna control it because you wanna control plants when they're actively growing. So just some examples of cool season and warm season grasses. Most of the grasses that we grow in our landscape lawns are cool season grasses that then we have to water a lot to keep alive through the summer when it's warm out and they naturally wanna go dormant. And so we spend a lot of energy um, trying to keep them from going dormant, which is what they biologically want to do. So Kentucky bluegrass, perennial rye, annual rye, fescues, and then crabgrass, 
zoysia grass, nimble will. Oh, these are usually these are considered weed grasses and they're warm season grasses. So a lot of the grasses we plant on purpose are cool season grasses, and a lot of the grasses we consider weeds are warm season grasses. So these are what will be actively growing in nice and bright green when your lawn is going brown in the summer. So who knew that there was this much going on in a grass plant? All of these parts in the grass plant. This is how you tell one grass from another. Um, and a good ID guide will walk you through this. You probably need a hand lens, a magnifying glass, or I just learned, thanks to my students, I learned there's an app you can get on your phone. It's called Magnify, Magnifying Glass with Light. I don't know if any of you have used that, um, but you, it magnifies it using the camera on your phone and it's excellent. And it can take pictures of what you're magnifying. And I highly recommend you try that on cicadas if you have cicadas near you. You can get some really cool close up pictures of cicadas emerging um, or just hanging out. So anyway, these are, these are all the ways that you can identify a grass plant one from the other. If you're like me, like all grasses look the same. And then I learned about all of this. And so the ligules you can see here, this is it's sort of like the little modified leaf part here where the stem meets. And so they can be non-existent, hairy, or uh, have leaf-like membranes. Then there's the sheath and how the sheath is attached. And this is called the auricle, so like ear lobes almost, and whether they are long or short and stubby or non-existent. And then the collar is where the leaf attaches. Um, to the stem and how that looks. And then the leaf bud. So if you were to cut open a stem and you look inside it, if the leaf bud is rounded or folded, that's another way to tell types of grasses. So this is getting into the weeds, so to speak, about this. But um, yeah, and, and then you have seed heads. But ideally, you want to keep your plants from going to seed um, because you don't want any more weeds, right? So here we can see in person or in real life, uh, a photo of a real plant instead of an illustration of the stem, the growing point, and then the collar. So the, the ligule and the article are all right in here. And this is what we're using for ID. Also leaf shape characteristics on grasses are important. So whether it has a pointed tip, a boat shaped tip or a blunt or rounded tip um, can also help. Whether it's shiny, how the veins are arranged, the overall color and whether or not it has hairs on it are all also identifying characteristics for grasses. Oops, I pressed the wrong button, sorry. And then there's the collar area. So this is where the, the leaf attaches to the stem. And all of this is going on here. This is your primary identification for grasses. Of course, just as I mentioned before, you can take it to extension and they'll identify it for you, which is always helpful. These aren't so great to help send you know, if you send pictures of these, it's almost, it's still hard to identify. So it's better to have a live sample that you take to a person. Here's the leaf blade collars, the ligules. It, I was really anti lawns and grasses and I just thought they were super boring until I learned all of this. And I was like, oh, there's more to a grass plant than I thought was going on. So it can be interesting, at least for a little while. There's the absent ligule and Kentucky bluegrass. And then hairs. Fringe of hairs or um, membranous ligules here. Membranous. See how hairy zoysia grass is. And then oracles, like the little earlobes where the leaf blade attaches. So now you all are going to go out and sit in your lawns if you have them and take a close look and look for all these little details. And then this is vernation. So this is how the, the newest, the buds of the newest uh, leaf leaves are going to come out. How, if, whether or not they're rolled or folded, which I always had trouble telling because when you cut it open, you squished it and then everything looked folded. So I could never figure that out. And then we have sedges. So they're plants that look like grasses, but they're not grasses. Sedges have edges, rushes are round. Um, grasses have joints from the tops to the ground, something like that. But uh, sedges will never have hair on them. So if you see hairs, that's usually indicated, uh, indicates that you have a grass. So here we have sedges are usually triangular and very angular. Grass and then sedge stem, you can see there. 
And this matters because um, there's chemicals, if you're using chemicals, again, if you're using chemicals to manage weed, there are, is broadleaf weed control, there's grass control, and then there's sedge control. Just, just because something kills a grass does not mean it'll kill a sedge. And so you need to understand which plant you have so you can get the right chemicals if you're choosing to use chemicals. Um, if there's hair, it's not a sedge. So here you see hair on the leaf blade of grass and then on the leaf stem as, as well. Here's what I was talking about in the beginning with yellow nut sedge. And so here you see the root and then you have these tiny little tubers is spread by rhizome, tiny little tuber that creates a new plant. So if you were to pull this out, this tuber would stay in and create a new plant. Um, in professional management of nut sedge, the timing of the application, this, this tuber will eventually fall off. It'll um, detach from the, from the parent plant eventually. So the application of chemical to control this is timed in a way that this is still attached to the plant. Um, so that you're getting, you're killing these nutlets also. And so timing is really important and understanding the way this plant grows is really important. So broadleaf weed identification, we're looking at flowers, leaves, stems. Sometimes we look at the family to help identify it. So family of plants share common characteristics in a lot of cases. And so it can help you narrow, narrow down who that plant might belong to. Again, these are the ID characteristics that we look at. There's a lot of them. And then we look at the plant form. So is it herbaceous? Is it a vine? Is it a tree? Is it a shrub? Leaf arrangement and leaf shape. So is it opposite, alternate? Are there um, lobes? You know, we want to look at all of those details. I'm sorry, there was a noise outside the window I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Here we have various leaf shape that you're going to look at. And when I said cotyledons, seed leaves before, this is what I meant. So when your seed first comes up, those of you who have grown plants from seeds, you um, know that the first two leaves that come out don't look anything like the plant is supposed to look. And those are what we call cotyledons or seed leaves. Those are the first leaves and they're usually big and round and wide um, and, and differently shaped because they need to get all the sun they can because they're starting the photosynthetic process so that plant can continue to grow. That, that seed, remember, it doesn't have any, any it only has enough energy to put that first set of leaves up and then that plant has to start photosynthesizing so it can grow big. And so these fat leaves and these um, the longer leaves, they need to spread wide and get as much sunshine as possible so they can photosynthesize so that that plant can have the energy to continue to grow. But you always see them, they're always first out, they're opposite and they usually look different than what the plant is going to look like. But you can use those as ID characteristics also. Some people are really great at identifying weeds by their cotyledons. I think that that's too small of a time. They're too tiny and I'm not bothering with them at that point. I wait till they get bigger to pull them out. That's just my personal preference. And of course there's trees. So here we have tree of heaven. This is Alanthus um, tree of heaven here. So we have um, a number of weed that can be trees, shrubs, vines, you know, anything can be a, can be a weed. And so managing weeds in the landscape, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, prevention, so we just manage our landscape in a way that doesn't provide a spot for weeds to come in and succeed. We keep weed seeds out of our compost and out of our soil. When we're pulling weeds, we make sure that there's no weed seed um, on those plants when we um, compost them and we don't let our weeds go to seed, right? So that's some ways to prevent weeds in the first place. Um, making sure your soil is covered with mulch, but more preferably with plants that don't allow any germination of any weed seed. Then there's cultural practices. And um, that just means, um, again, preventing, preventing weeds from going to seed but also making sure that your plants, that your desirable plants are thriving because the right plant is in the right place. It's the right sun, it's the right moisture for the plants you have. Those plants will fill in better and then not allow a place for weeds to settle in. So we have a ground cover garden here at the Arboretum that we love because it is three trees and then there's an oval and it's all planted with our desirable plants as ground covers. We never have to weed it, we never have to mulch it and um, it just works great. So you can use plants as mulch. That's a great cultural practice to prevent weeds. Mechanical techniques. 
So that is hand pulling, using a hoe to, um, to get the, the weeds out of there. In this case, goats to help manage weeds. Um, those are all mechanical techniques. Then there's biological controls. And so the biological controls are bringing in the weeds natural enemy. And so with um, Japanese stilt grass, they found that there's a rust fungus that is starting to affect that. So that can may be introduced as a biological control into Japanese stilt grass stand. Um, for other weeds, there's other insects that might eat them. And then you have chemical techniques, which are usually spraying some sort of pesticide, some herbicide onto the weeds. So those are your options for management. Or you can just leave it be if you enjoy it, then it's not really a weed, is it? So remember, this is a mile a minute here. And for those of us who pay attention to such things, we get really excited when we see holes in the leaves of weeds or invasive plants. Now this is considered an invasive plant and a noxious weed, but you see these holes here. This is exciting because invasive plants and weeds generally don't have things that feed on them. That's another reason why they succeed so well is because not much is doing anything to control them out in nature. But um, in this case, a weevil was found where the um, mile a minute vine is native and it was brought back here and tested over a number of years through protocol to make sure that they're doing their best so it wouldn't cause harm out in the environment, which usually means looking at related plants that are valuable to, to the United States and making sure that these insects won't affect them. And then, um, and then they're released and they started eating these. And so biological controls, we love to see holes in these leaves because it means the weevils are out there. We have holes in the leaves of the mile minute here. Um, this can be frustrating for some people though because biological controls never equal eradication. Biological controls are always just maintaining a, a balance. Um, so ideally this plant doesn't get out of control anymore because if the biological control, the weevils ate all of the plant, then they wouldn't survive. So they can't do that. Um, so it's really just introducing a check and balance so it doesn't get as out of control as it has been in the past. So that's biological controls, what they do. Same thing as ladybugs and aphids in a garden. Some more prevention, cleaning your mower equipment. If you know you just ran over a bunch of plants that had weed seeds on them, you might want to wash off your mower. Um, taking plants, friends sharing plant material, like taking somebody's plant that they dug up from their yard. A lot of times weed are, weeds, and I've seen lots of noxious weeds and invasive weeds introduced to people's landscapes through sharing. There's a lot of weeds that disappear in the spring and you don't know that they're there. And somebody digs up this beautiful plant in the summer and wants to give it to you, not knowing that all of these terrible weeds are in the soil mass. So I would just think very carefully about accepting plants from your friends. Um, you just really wanna know what's growing there before you take it. Uh, using weed-free seeds, uh, seed sources when you are planting from seed, and then scouting, just keeping an eye on your weeds and seeing um, seeing what, what is growing and what's getting ready to set seed, um, and then stopping it from setting seed. That's all prevention. So cultural practices. So here's a, a lawn. It's relatively weed-free, looks like here. And there's a lot you can do in your lawn, just in cultural practices alone, that will keep weeds out of your lawns. So um, just mowing between three and four inches of height will eliminate a wide, a, a, a vast amount of, of weeds in your lawn because the grass is higher, it's shaded, it shades out the soil so the seeds can't germinate, it keeps moisture in there so the grass is healthier and able to form a thicker stand which doesn't allow the weeds to compete in your lawn. So simply raising the mowing height will do wonders for keeping weeds out of your um, garden or out of your lawn. So fertilize, fertilizing it and um, just making sure that the, the, the lawn is healthy will help that also. And then um, keeping people from walking on it or, or uh, damaging it can help too, right? So mowing at a height, but also mowing with sharp blades. If you don't use sharp blades, um, your grass looks like this and it starts to, um, decline and then weed seeds can germinate in here and fill in. So you want to make sure your um, mower is sharp. And here you see this is um, spurge infestation. So this is a type of weed 
um, cold spurge in invading a lawn. And you just see the difference of when the grass is cut to one inch, which is like golf course kind of cutting, which I don't know why anybody would do that, but um, an inch and three quarters. And then at two and a half inches, how much less there is. And then if you just cut it at three, there's almost no weeds in there any, anymore. So, so something to think about uh, if you're concerned about weeds in your lawn is just mowing higher. Uh, same with crabgrass. You can see incidence of crabgrass in tall fescue. When it was cut at four inches, there's no crabgrass. When it was cut at one inch, there was this much crabgrass. So you can see what a, what a difference it makes, just the mowing heights. There's just a lot of this because people are, there's a lot of lawn. So same idea. Um, and then the roots actually respond in kind. So when you cut grass short, the roots stay short. When you leave grass longer, the roots stay longer. When the roots stay longer, the lawn is more drought resistant. It can access um, different nutrients and uh, minerals farther down in the soil. So it creates a healthier stand of grass by, by leaving it taller also. And a healthier stand of grass fills in floor, doesn't have as many places for the weeds to settle in. So, so there's a, a number of reasons why you should cut your grass higher. And then if you leave your clippings, you can apply two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet by leave, leaving your clipping by mul using a mulching mower every time you cut. And of course that adds nutrients back into the grass, which creates a stronger stand of grass, which helps um, with competition from weeds. Um, irrigation, if you water, you can, you can be causing more problems with weeds also. If there's too much water, your grass isn't gonna be happy. It's gonna be, um, easily uh, infiltrated by weeds. And um, in some cases, like with nut sedge and rough bluegrass, if there is too much water, these plants thrive in those conditions. And so they'll happily march into your lawn. So you wanna make sure that you're watering deeply and infrequently to encourage those deep roots and that healthy, healthy stand. Now, when we're talking about um, mechanical techniques here, hand pulling, hoeing, mowing, plowing, disking, tilling, digging, mulching are all examples of mechanical techniques for managing um, weeds. And, but remember what I said about understanding the life cycle and the growth, the way the plant grows uh, before you till anything. Otherwise you just end up with so much more than, than what you had. And here you see the tap root here. So you wanna make sure you understand how the, you identify the plant and understand how it grows. So you can get that tap root out is an example of mulching to keep weeds out, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. And then we have chemical controls. These are called herbicides. And um, of course, it's the law to follow the label exactly. Um, if you don't do that, you're breaking the law. Um, so you wanna make sure you're following that exactly for location and what you're spraying. And um, it's important to keep in mind that there have been many incidences of weeds um, picking up herbicide resistance. And that means that um, through either incomplete applications, incorrect applications, or just too frequent of applications, um, the weed, the, a weed population has shown ability to survive a herbicide application that was previously known to control the population. So, so when you, if you choose to use chemicals, you wanna make sure that you're using them in the right way at the proper rate um, as explained exactly on the label itself. Otherwise you can start um, causing other problems in your landscape. In, in the Arboretum, we, um, we do use chemicals. We, use, um, we do use Roundup in the pathways because we just don't have the people or the, um, the people power to pull weeds out of pathways. So we do use it there, but in the gardens, primarily everything's hand weeded. So we are very uh, judicious with our, with how we um, apply our weed control, but we do, we do use it. We're not organic. We practice what's called integrated pest management and in integrated pest management or integrated vegetation management means that we assess a garden. We come up with the, a um, threshold that we're willing to accept as far as um, damage or infiltration of weeds goes. And then we work to maintain that threshold through working through mechanical controls um, 
uh, prevention, mechanical controls, biological controls, and then chemical controls if necessary. But um, we do use pre-emergent too in the landscape as well. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing just quickly and take some questions. And then I'm just gonna see if I can pull up something else quickly. But I am um, going to stop sharing. Happy to take your questions. And then let me see if I can get here. Slideshow. Oh, oh, good. I didn't lose you all. That's nice. All right. So I saw some questions in here. And I was going to show you some weeds, but um, let's see. Um, how do I deal with weeds that spread through underground runners so you can never get all the roots out? Uh, persistence. That is the way. It, um, if, if you are not using chemicals, the only way to get plants that have those spreading roots, those runners out, is you take out as much as you can, you see what comes back next year, you take out mu as much as you can, and you just do that year after year. That is the best way to do it. Now, if you're dealing with a chemical, there is a chemical called a systemic herbicide. And basically what you do is um, you want to very carefully, because a lot of times these are non-selective, so they will kill any of the plants around you, maybe not the grasses, but the broad leaves depends on what you're using. But, um, and you paint, you can literally take a, a paintbrush or some people um, call it the glove of death. They, they put a, a glove on and a, another glove on and then they put their hand in and then they just sort of touch the plant that they want to die. Um, and the systemic herbicide actually is absorbed into the system of the weed. And so it'll go through all of those roots and get most of it. Um, you, again, you might need a couple applications of that insect, uh, that herbicide for it to be effective on these, especially persistent weeds. But if you are not wanting to use chemicals, just frequent digging out um, year after year is how you're gonna get it out. That's how I did with mint. I had mint that escaped everywhere. And so it was just every year seeing what new came up and, and pulling it out. Um, so that is, that's the way that you deal with that. Um, the name of the app with the magnifier is um, I really think it was called Magnifying Lens with Light. Very simple, straightforward app, free to download. Um, so what does Roundup do to the groundwater? So, um, so there is a lot of research on, on that. Roundup does, uh, has been shown not to affect groundwater. It's the, um, there's a chemical that's added to Roundup. It's called a surfactant that gets it to stick to the plant that does cause problems in the water. And so, um, so that's why it's really important to follow the label instructions. When something says, do not use near water, that's why. Um, Roundup gets um, bound up in, in, with soil particles. So it doesn't go through, it doesn't get, it, it, it does not move in water, just, just so you know that. And it functions within plants. It's designed to function within plants. So, um, but there is a lot of research out there and, um, there is, you know, a lot of concern about using Roundup uh, and a lot of different opinions out there, but that's what the science says so far. And I have an app called Picture This. Are you familiar with it? If so, is it reliable? Yes, so I use that. There are a number of plant identification apps out there that have gotten a lot better. One of the things I have my students do um, each fall is they analyze the plant identification apps that are out there for reliability, you know, value, all of that stuff. And picture this does work pretty well. Um, PlantNet works very well. iNaturalist is a great one because there's humans that are checking the identification of that. So there's a number of good ones out there. And um, yes, yeah, so, so, so yes, that, that one is as good as, as um, some of the other ones that are out there. They're all, they're all, to me, they're hit or miss still, um, but they're getting more and more reliable. The more people use them, it's basically crowd sourced and it builds its library based on what people are taking pictures of. So um, over time, it just keeps getting better and better. So I remember when they first came out and they were horrible. You just got, you know, it would tell me I was looking at a papaya in Pennsylvania. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Um, and, but now they're, they're getting much better now. So, um, so any other any other questions from anyone? You can unmute yourself. You can um, write it in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Someday, I hope that 
we'll have you back here in the Arboretum and we can do a weed walk and talk about the weeds that we find and who they are, how to identify them. Um, There's so many out there. And um, sorry, <laughs> strong wind, <laughs> just, just uh, wow. Um, yes, you can dig out dandelions now by the roots. That's no problem. Is there a way to get rid of poison ivy? Those goats, they'll eat poison ivy. You can use a systemic herbicide to control poison ivy if you need to. Um, you can uh, hand pull it if it's little, if it's big and crawling up trees, you cut a, a two inch section out of the vine um, itself. And then you can paint that, you can paint that stump that's left with a systemic herbicide and it'll just go into there and kill the bottom and then the top will be killed. But remember, even after it's dead, the poison ivy oils are still in there and can cause um, problems. So you wanna make sure you're protected if you're pulling it off of whatever it's growing on. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us here. It is a gorgeous day outside and I hope everybody gets out to enjoy it and um, takes a look at their weeds in a different way. I have a three elongated leaf weed that pulls out easily. I would need to see it, Tish, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, I would need to see a picture of it, but, um, but I'm sure extension can help you with that. And, um, and if you're ever walking around in the Arboretum and you see it growing here and you ask us what it is, we could probably tell you what it is. So we're a resource here too. All right, well, thank you everybody. There's still a lot of time left in the day, it's still gorgeous out. So, uh, so enjoy and I hope I'll see you in the garden. I hope we'll cross paths and um, the gardens are open and you can come and visit anytime. So take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And like I said, the recording will be available probably within the next day or so. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel as well as our Upper Dublin Rec website. And we will send the link out to all of you. And we hope to see you at the next class. Have a great day. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Bye.